you gave me shared screen. Uh, no, you should ask for a shared screen. Oh, okay, but it's the option is there. Yeah, the option is there, and uh, you can then. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, when you I start, will, I will, then I will, will share, share my screen. Your, uh, screen. Right. Yes. Wow, the participants are joining already 90 now. Yeah, no, we'll wait another minute, okay, Karma, course, to um, have people all accessing. And then we'll uh, start in a moment. Salam alaikum, uh, marhaba. Saudi Arabia. Yes, good morning. Sabah al -Hair. Yeah, in other places, it's already afternoon, so good afternoon. <laughs> I'm still confused with this timing. It's it's really, I don't know if I told you, Karma, I had a workshop uh, some uh, two weeks ago um, in uh, um, the Saudi Arabia um, timing, and I thought it's uh, two hours uh, actually earlier. I mean that I thought they are two hours earlier, but they are actually later. And then just uh, last minute, I uh, I realized that I have to speak in like five minutes. You know, <laughs> it was totally confusing. And um, and I checked my watch, you know, because you have uh, on your phone you have this. Um, uh, functions, uh, world clock, yeah, and everything. It changes and automatically. Still, My yeah. phone changes automatically. Yeah, no, but you can also see the um, uh, the time in different places, so you can check uh, against your yeah, own uh, yeah. time zone. But still, I got um, good morning, salam alaikum. Hello, hello, Vanessa. Good morning, Miss Nadra Manal. So nice to see so many names from many countries. We'll still wait one minute, okay? And then we'll start. Salam alaikum, hello. Mr. Saleh, Dr. Faiz, Amal. From Riyadh, Syria, and so on, Oman. Jordan. Jordan. Wow. Nisana, Jordan, good mm. morning. Good morning from Algeria. Bonjour. <laughs> I always like to practice my French, you know, so in my uh, youth time, I dreamed to be a French teacher, but then I changed my mind and I decided to study philosophy and education. So, <laughs> but uh, hi, good morning from Abex, uh, Qatar. Salam alaikum, Jordan again, Iraq, good morning, good, Lebanon, good, good. Sabah al -Hair. There is certificate, so I will announce again, there is a certificate and I will check again with my colleagues because they are released automatically. Mm. Yes, but I will mention this. Okay, so uh, uh, I think we can start. So, salam alaikum, sabah al -hair. Good morning, everyone. Um, bonjour, <laughs> and welcome uh, to this uh, session uh, that we planned for today on formative assessment, on its role uh, within national systems of assessment, its benefits, and also what are teacher roles in formative assessment. Um, as uh, some of you may uh, remember, those who participated on November 3rd uh, this year, uh, we launched uh, the discussion on a regional uh, learning assessment framework, a draft learning assessment framework that Dr. Karma Al Hassan developed um, with our office. And um, during the discussion on the 3rd of November, we said that uh, we'll try to uh, conduct a series of uh, webinars 
a series of uh, these uh, online workshops on different topics uh, that the learning assessment framework actually tackled. Among these topics is uh, this issue of uh, formative assessment, which uh, we know about. <laughs> Um, and uh, we practiced in, uh, in different ways, but um, uh, we also know now that uh, with the pandemic experience, uh, formative assessment um, regain momentum. And we want to know more about, um, uh, about this uh, topic, about how it works, especially uh, within uh, remote and online learning environments, and what teachers can do um, as during this um, um, latest discussion we had on the 3rd of November, many of you asked about formative assessment, uh, we thought to start this series of, uh, of webinars with uh, the topic of formative assessment that should, of course, complement other uh, forms of assessment like summative assessment. And Dr. Karmal Hassan, our distinguished uh, guest and consultant from um, the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, uh, she will um, have a presentation in a few minutes about uh, this, uh, this topic. And then we, of course, we would like to listen to your questions and comments and to see what other modalities of, uh, of capacity development uh, we can actually put in place uh, next year. Because next year we would like to continue this uh, series of uh, webinars on assessment topics in collaboration with our colleagues from uh, UNESCO headquarters. Um, when we presented uh, three weeks ago the draft learning assessment framework, uh, we invited also uh, our colleagues from headquarters from Paris, uh, who talked about UNESCO's work in assessment and uh, who shared different uh, resources and links and talked about partnerships um, between UNESCO and other uh, organizations like uh, the International Assessment Agency, OECD and the World Bank and many others. So uh, there uh, will be also um, uh, quite uh, soon, uh, I think if I'm not wrong, on the 7th, 7th, there will be the launching of the regional um, report on learning loss. That is a joint report by the World Bank, UNICEF and UNESCO. So uh, this has been announced already, so those interested can also take part in that uh, webinar to learn about uh, learning loss and how can we assess learning loss and how can we know more about learning loss and uh, cope with learning loss in a constructive way so that uh, the topic of learning loss is not just a topic, but we find the solutions to mitigate or to prevent uh, learning loss in the conditions of uh, um, pandemic uh, teaching and learning and uh, with this uh, new remote and online uh, learning environments. So I would first, before giving the floor to Dr. Karmal Hassan, I would like to announce some house rules for this uh, webinar so that we are all clear. Uh, and uh, the first is about the language because uh, on your screens, uh, on the right side on my screen, uh, I don't know uh, the others, but uh, there is a, um, a, a symbol of the Earth globe, and that's uh, the symbol for interpretation. So you can choose your language, either Arabic or English, and please mute the original language. And then you will hear just uh, the language that the speaker is using. Like in my case, now I'm using English, then Dr. Karma will use Arabic at the beginning, and she will present in English, but we have um, simultaneous interpretation with our very uh, good interpreters, uh, Mrs. Elsa Risk and Mrs. Rana Dau. And I'm thanking them already in advance because uh, we work with them for long and they are always uh, providing excellent uh, translation. Uh, then uh, for question and answers and comments, uh, please use these two functions uh, the chat function and the question and uh, answer function. And uh, here uh, you can 
place your uh, comments, your questions in both English and Arabic. Feel free to use Arabic because we have colleagues who are helping us uh, to collect uh, the, the questions and to summarize them for our uh, speaker. Uh, Mrs. Noor Osta from our office, UNESCO office in Beirut, and Mrs. Linian Edobazi, who is my program assistant. So I have to also introduce myself. I always presume people know me, but maybe they don't know me. <laughs> so I'm Dagmara Georgescu. I'm the program specialist um, for the education uh, sector in UNESCO Beirut, our regional office for um, education in the Arab states, uh, and I'm dealing with the regional programs for curriculum and uh, teachers. Uh, so um, the um, other issue I want to mention is that uh, during our discussion, while Dr. Karma will present, uh, we uh, will be also sharing again uh, in the chat function uh, the learning assessment framework, which is for now in English, but it's going to be translated in Arabic as well as other resources. And at the end, we'll also share the presentation of Dr. Karma so that you have all this uh, information. And um, then the other information is about um, the certificates. Uh, the certificate should be provided automatically uh, if your email address is uh, correct, so and the names are uh, correct, uh, I will check again with uh, my colleagues from the ICT department to make sure that you will receive the certificates. Uh, there will be also a YouTube uh, recording and um, now in December, the beginning of December, I will place all the recordings of our uh, latest uh, events since uh, October on our website, UNESCO Beirut office uh, website. And so you, you will be able to uh, access uh, this session and to have uh, free access to all these recordings uh, over the last uh, two months uh, with our four uh, webinars so far that we conducted on teachers uh, and on assessment. And tomorrow there will be a webinar on uh, curriculum adjustment. Uh, uh, with the um, pandemic uh, experience. And we called it again, post-pandemic curriculum adjustment because at a certain point we hope to get rid of the pandemic, but um, lessons learned uh, from the pandemic will help us also rethink uh, curriculum issues, assessment teacher issues, uh, so that learning becomes um, more efficient, uh, we use uh, technologies, but with a pedagogical uh, scope, and uh, we uh, can help students learn uh, in an enjoyable uh, way and within uh, an enjoyable um, and um, enabling environment. So I hope uh, these are the, the issues um, for the house rules. Maybe there are others, but uh, I, um, I think uh, we will check your, um, uh, we will check your uh, um, comments and uh, questions. And um, we will then uh, start uh, by giving the floor to Dr. Karma Hassan. A warm welcome, Dr. Karma our long-term collaborator. I mean, she does not need a lot of introduction, but for those of, the, of you who don't know her, uh, Dr. Karmail Hassan is an international specialist in um, education evaluation, uh, both uh, evaluation of learning outcomes and also institutional uh, evaluation. Uh, for years, she was heading uh, in uh, AUB, in the American University of Beirut, uh, the Directorate for Institutional Evaluation, and she's teaching about uh, assessment and evaluation, and she's contributing to several uh, big initiatives in UNESCO and uh, in our office in UNESCO Paris, and also in our office on different um, important education uh, issues. Among other, Dr. Karma, she uh, worked with us since 2019 on this topic of um, alignment for learning, because this is another big initiative of uh, UNESCO. 
uh, about how to uh, make these three main components, curriculum assessment and uh, teaching practices to, to talk to one another, to work in a harmonized way so that the SDG4 targets can be achieved uh, in a cohesive uh, manner. Uh, and uh, she's also uh, now helping us with this learning assessment framework. Uh, but again, she's also involved in many international um, activities that look into evaluation aspects from a global uh, perspective. So we are very happy to listen to Dr. Carmel Hassan for approximately half an hour. Uh, and then we will open up the discussion for uh, your question, comments and your uh, contributions. Uh, thank you very much. So Dr. Karma, you, uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dakmara, for this introduction. And Mesa El Khir, Lal Jamia Zumala, who you said me, Hai at an Nikun Makon Yom Kamen, we had webinar on El Takim Tequini, who will follow Edmino, who Kafi Jra, who will Amelie, who the Uduru will be Takim Talum, who inshallah Bitkun Bikun Haydel El Webinar Mufid. وهو نحن عم نربطه بالمثل ما قال الدكمارة بال بإطار تقييم التعلم اللي اللي أطلقناه بأول شهر نوفمبر واللي هلا مثل ما قال الدكمارة كمان عم بيجي ترجمة الدوكيمنت حتى نحطها نشاركها مع الجميع باللغة العربية ونأخذ ال 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 الانبوت منكم وال وال والتغذية الراجعة منكم ولا حظاتكم عليها حتى نبلش الدسكشن والمناقشة بأوائل السنة الجديدة ومثل ما حكينا أنه هذا أول ورشة عمل بعد الورشة ال تبع 3 نوفمبر عن الإطار التقييم التعلم لأنه لاحظنا أن التقييم التكويني كثير في في أسئلة عليه ولأهميته ولدوره بعمل بالعملية التقييم التعلم حبينا نعمل أول ورشة عمل على التقييم التكويني بقى أنا أنا رح رح أعمل شيرينج لل للبرزنتيشن تبعي and inshallah be and I look forward للأسئلتكن وملاحظاتكن على ال على ال على presentation العنوان ال presentation the title of the presentation اللي هي formative assessment its benefits and the role of teachers and we're going to focus on the role of teachers what I hope to cover in this presentation of course I have to link the formative assessment to the whole learning assessment paradigm and what the, where does the formative assessment fit within this paradigm and then what are its principles what are its characteristics the processes that we undergo when we are doing formative assessment what what role teachers play in formative assessment and then we will look at some practical applications you know the, uh, that we use in the classroom to apply formative assessment and the, how and of course recently and with the pandemic and we have a rise in digital use of the formative assessment, we will also go over some uh, of, of the tools that were used during the pandemic and that are increasing now one after the other. As you know, uh, recent uh, with the introduction, recent years we, we really have witnessed a great shift and deep transformation in how we conceptualize what is learning, how students learn, what is assessment, what's evaluation, what do we count as achievement, and a, a lot of this shift has been explained already in the learning assessment framework that we that we presented early November, and. Uh, 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 in parallel with the shift in what is learning and how students learn, there has been a shift in assessment from mainly focusing on psychometrics, on numbers, on, on properties like reliability and technical qualities to really learning assessment, you know, uh, assessment of learning using different tools, using different kinds of um, uh, a continuous assessment, you know, using different tools and um, uh, assessing the whole person 
person, assessing not only knowledge, but how to do things and understanding. And so we moved from a testing culture to an assessment culture. Now we rarely use testing in our terminology. And of course, the, our experience in the last two years with the pandemic has also opened the doorway to a new system that really relies less on tests. We couldn't give tests during the pandemic. Uh, and we had to use a new modality of conducting assessment. We had to resort to new practices. And of course, we, we, we assessed different content and different kind, kind of skills. The, uh, the need for formative assessment during the pandemic was really became critical, really critical, because learning took place outside of the physical classroom and teachers and parents who turned teachers, you know, they needed to understand whether students are absorbing the content that's delivered to them in formats that really differ from business and as usual. So really formative assessment became more and more critical and more important due to the pandemic. Uh, as a recap of what we did in the webinar in early November, we, we really adopted this definition that learning assessment is the ongoing process. It is not a one shot kind of assessment. It's ongoing. We collect information. We document that information. Documentation is very important. And then we look at that information. We reflect on it. What does it mean? Where are we now? What do we need to reach our goals? And then and most importantly, we need to make use of that information. And, uh, and that information is about how, how much students know, what do they know, knowledge, what do they understand. It's not me. So we go to higher levels of acquisition and what they can do. The, the, the performance is very, very important in order to make use of that information on knowledge, understanding, and performance to, really, to make informed decisions. There has to be decisions based on that evidence that we are collecting. And in, in this learning assessment, we want to capture what are the learning gaps. You know, students have had the difficult two years and last two years, and there are learning gaps. We need to identify these learning gaps. We need to identify the learning loss. And as Nakmara mentioned, um, a report will be, will, will, it will be issued, I think, in next week or so about uh, uh, these learning gaps and these learning losses of students. And these are not only only in terms of cognitive and knowledge info aspect, but, but also the non-cognitive skills and social emotional skills and the digital skills. Uh, these need to be identified and interventions have to be developed to address these gaps. We all know how much our, our children and our students suffered, not only in terms of a learning loss, but also in terms of social emotional uh, uh, skills that they have lost and uh, and how well they are now coping with their digital skills so uh, a, a learning assessment will help us acquire all of these now as you know and we uh, we mentioned uh, assessment may take different modalities depending on the purpose and i'm just going to go over you know quickly over the main three purposes or uh, that we conduct assessment for. And I'm going to follow, you know, the sequence of instruction, the way instruction happens and how we use each one of these assessment uh, modalities. After I start teaching my lesson to my students, and I really need to capture how much uh, they learned of what I really wanted them to learn, I need to do assessment for learning because I, I need to do a quick assessment. Maybe I ask questions or I give them a practice exercise or they do some seat work. And I really want to, um, to, uh, to make a quick assessment. Uh, did, uh, did they understand what I tried to explain to them? And uh, this is what we call assessment for learning and it enables me as a teacher to use the information that I'm 
uh, I'm connecting uh, in this quick assessment about students' knowledge and understanding to inform my teaching. What should I do now after I look at this evidence? Should I re-explain again? Should I give them more practice? Should I really ask them to read again? What should I do so it will inform my teaching? And then according to this evidence that I'm collecting, I will give the students feedback about where they are uh, regarding the learning outcome, about their learning, and what they should do in order to reach the learning outcome and to improve. So I do that, you know, and it's it's really within my instruction as, as I'm teaching, I stop, I do this assessment, I interpret it, and then I make use of it to improve my teaching and to improve student learning. At the same time with it, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we use assessment as learning. When I share with the students, you know, after I explain, I share the criteria for giving an oral presentation or what he should include in a written assignment. And I explain that criteria and the student needs to evaluate himself or assess himself ahead of time before he submits the draft to me, then I'm, uh, assessment becomes learning itself. And here I'm involving the students in the learning process. They monitor their own progress. They ask questions, they, they, they uh, use the criteria that I shared with them and the feedback that I would be providing them uh, with to reflect on their learning, to consolidate their understanding and work to achieve their learning goals. So assessment for learning and assessment for, as learning work together and they happen during instruction. At the end of instruction, I need to assess, you know, at the end of the month or the unit or the semester, I really need to get um, a summative kind of assessment. Uh, how much the students, how well did they attain my learning targets and how well did they attain the learning goals. And I need to collect evidence of student learning to assess their achievement and against the standards and the learning goals. And this happens at the end of instruction. Instruction. So these are the three main purposes for which we use assessment. Our uh, focus today will be on the assessments that happen during the formation of learning. And that's why we call it formative assessment. It's ass and they are basically assessment for learning and assessment as learning. Now, the uh, and as we discussed in the, web, the early November webinar, there has been a change in the assessment paradigm, a, a complete change, you know. And now the, the emphasis on, as, as I mentioned, on assessment to improve learning and assessment as learning. Initially, traditionally, our main focus was basically to assess the end of instruction learning, assessment of learning, the summative assessment. And less was done on for and as assessment. But with the changing paradigm of what is learning, how students learn, uh, uh, and the adoption of a forward-looking concept of, concept of teaching, learning, assessment, where assessment really becomes a learning experience. You know, when I use assessment for learning and when students use assessment as learning, assessment becomes a learning experience. I learn what I should do next and students learn what they should do to improve and to really attain the learning out outcomes. Students become aware of how they learn and they will become more engaged and more active. And we all know that with students becoming more engaged and more active, they are more likely going to learn and to keep that, that learning for a longer time. And they become more responsible because I have shared with them the criteria ahead of time. And before they submit a draft for me, they are going to assess themselves on this, on this criteria and see how well they have done and they become they become able to monitor their own learning and so now the, we have the now we view assessment in this reconfigured uh, pyramid you know uh, in this reconfigured assessment as you can see assessment is learning is the is the prime and then, of course, assessment for learning. They make up most of the assessment. Of course, we still keep assessment of learning, but, but, but assessment as learning and for learning become, uh, become really of prime importance. And assessment would still 
take a large part of, of the school day uh, in, uh, under the reconfigured assessment paradigm, but not in the form of separate tests, you know, but it is part of the learning pro pro uh, process. When students really take the, 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 the benchmark criteria and they assess themselves, when I look at the results of the formative assessment and then decide what to do next and how to help students and provide them with feedback, this is all learning. This is all part of the learning experience and assessment becomes part of the learning experience and the learning process. So assessment would still be conducted in the a reconfigured assessment paradigm, but it would be part of the learning process and not something coming at the end. So this is the main change in assessment that uh, on which formative assessment uh, uh, is based on. After this introduction on the changing landscape in, in learning and assessment, uh, I would like to start talking about our main topic, which is formative, formative assessment. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm using a quote from Black and William, and they are really the, the uh, top names uh, on formative assessment. They uh, had they did lots of research on it, and uh, many of the processes and the um, the ways of implementing it were, were was based on their research and their work. Black and William, and they define formative assessment is the extent that evidence, so when we do a formative assessment, we're collecting evidence about student achievement and then we interpret it. And as you can see, it is a collaborative process. I collect evidence and it has to be used by teachers, learners, and the peers. It is not a one, you know, it's not only teachers and top down kind of process. It's a collaborative process between teachers, learners, and their peers. And they use that evidence to make decisions about next steps. There has to be next steps. If there are no next steps, it will not be formative. So it's, I need to, to do assessment, collect evidence, and then we as teachers, peers, and, and, and learners, we, 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 we interpret this evidence and decide what to do next. What do I need to do next myself as a teacher? Do I re-explain? Do I give extra reading? Do I give extra practice, uh, extra seat work? And then I give feedback to the student and based on that, he has to do something. So the next steps is an integral part of formative assessment. And, uh, and, and accordingly that the decisions based on this assessment will lead to better learning. Um, there are two criteria when we want to judge if an assessment is formative or not. One, it has to be done in the middle during instruction. It doesn't come at the end. And then it can identify one of the following purposes. You know, uh, its purpose is to uh, either I can identify student strength and weakness or help me myself, you know, what do I do next? You know, what uh, do, do I, do I uh, re-explain the lesson or can I move to the, the subsequent lesson and so on? And then also helps the students in guiding their own learning. What do they need to do uh, next? Helps them in gaining self-evaluation skills. And accordingly, it will increase their autonomy. They become more responsible. They can work on their own. And these are very, very important skills that we really want to promote in students and they become more responsible. So the, the uh, purposes of a, of a formative assessment can be uh, any of these four purposes and it has to be done during instruction. Accordingly, uh, this is the, uh, you know, well, uh, how it works. There's a cycle by which uh, a formative assessment works. First, I define my learning outcomes. What do I expect my students to know from a certain lesson or a unit? And it has, these outcomes need to be specified and clear to the students and to myself. I teach. You know, whatever I, I use different kind of instructional methodology to help the students uh, to, uh, you know attain these learning outcomes 
And then I do, I need to do an evaluation in the middle of my instruction, you know, I can, it can be by observation. I, you know, while I'm teaching, I see that some students, I've lost them. They're bored or they're, oh, it's too easy for them or it's too difficult for them. They're not able to understand what I'm saying. So I need to stop and maybe ask a question or do some, or give them an, an, an exercise to really uh, identify, did they understand what I was trying to explain? Or I can ask questions or give them seat work, or I, I can have them evaluate themselves or their peers to evaluate their work, you know. So in the middle of my instruction, we stop and we do the, any one of these, there are other. A kind of formative assessment. And based on this assessment, I get some kind of evidence and I need to provide feedback to the student. And uh, the feedback needs to be immediate, you know, because it would be more useful, you know, uh, immediate. It has to be specific and linked to the learning outcome itself. It's not about the student. I like the student or I don't like the, we don't give qualitative, you know, excellent or good or, you know, we tell him exactly how well and how, how well he attained the specific learning outcome that we are trying to achieve from this exercise or from this lesson. So the feedback has to be immediate and specific and related to the learning outcome. And then we decide on the next steps, you know, what do I need to do as a teacher? to help, you know, based on my assessment, what do I need to do in order to make the uh, students attain the learning outcomes? And what the, what the students should do, should they, they do more seat work, more practice, more reading, search for something, and what do I need to do? And we continue like this, you know, with every new instruction, we, we stop in the middle before we continue. Uh, we need to make sure how well our students are learning. We do our assessment and based on that, we provide feedback and then we decide on the next steps. So this is the formative assessment cycle. And accordingly, we should by, by the end of the unit or by the end of the term with this kind of feedback and instructional correctives should be able to attain a higher percentage of students should be able to attain the learning outcomes and to all the standards and to master them. These are the key characteristics, you know, of a good a formative assessment. As I mentioned before, it's a collaborative process. You know, it's the teachers, the peers, the learners, it's not the teacher alone. And it has several components used by both teachers and students. It really relies on frequent assessments within the learning activities. You know, once I do oral questioning, another time I give them an exercise or I ask them to write me something or to come to the blackboard. You know, it's frequent assessments during the instruction. And it, a, a very key point to the formative assessment is that it provides feedback. Feedback is very important and it has to be, you know, the way to do feedback and what kind of feedback and how to word it is very important. It should be non-evaluative, no grades, uh, just specific and specific to the learning outcome. How well did you reach the learning outcome? Where are you in the process to reach the learning outcome? should be timely and, you know, writing comment. For example, if I ask for a written assessment, uh, providing, you know, I, I would provide them with a checklist by which to evaluate their written assessment. And I would provide them with comments regarding each one of these points uh, in, the, uh, in the checklist. And then they will know when they need to do the correctives, which points are missing and which points are not missing. So this is the, the feedback is really an essential part of the assessment. And after the feedback, I need to provide them with opportunity to revise what they have submitted, be it the oral presentation or the written assignment or the, the lab uh, report. Uh, they, have, they need to be given the opportunity to revise based on my comments, based on my feedback, based on comparing to the checklist to improve their work and to really get acquire a deep understanding. And of course, my, I myself, I need to, my, to do change uh, my instruction. I may need to, to re-explain again or uh, that I give them more reading or whatever it is. There is no evaluation. It is just feedback 
It is non-evaluated to, to help improve and reach the learning outcomes. It is student-centered, you know. Uh, I look at the results of every student and I give him the feedback based on how well is he attaining the learning outcome and where is he in that process? So it is student-centered. There might be some comments that really apply to the class as a whole. I will give the, the feedback to the class as a group because they, were, they, they had common misconceptions or common errors, but then I need to give uh, each student's comments that really apply uh, to his case. In, in particular, you know, he may have missed in making a conclusion in the written assessment, or he may, may have missed a certain point in the lab report. So it has to be, you know, not only group centered, but student centered. And of course, uh, a very important part and to make a formative assessment really successful or assessment for learning is we really need to share ahead of time the criteria and the rubrics by which we are going to evaluate any work they're going to submit, be it a lab report, a written um, uh, essay, um, an oral presentation, working cooperatively, all the criteria has to be uh, prepared ahead of time, shared with the students, explained to them, modeled what's a, what's a good behavior, what, what's a good performance model shared with them. And then students before submitting the draft and while they're working on that draft, they check themselves and they evaluate themselves, or we may have, or we may use peer assessment uh, in, in this respect. So to really have a good formative assessment, it should embody all of these characteristics. And this cloud really highlights the, the main points uh, that are really uh, characterize a good formative assessment or assessment for learning and as learning used by both Students take responsibility, they're becoming autonomous, no evaluation, it's a collaborative process during instruction, student-centered, several components and timely feedback and so on. So that could summarize all the um, characteristics of a good formative assessment. Now, what are the processes involved in a formative assessment? Basically, we have five processes, but first we need to know where, where, where the, when I do a formative assessment, I need to know where they are now with respect to what I want them to achieve. And then uh, of course we need to establish where they're going, what are our target, what are our targets, and we need to, what needs to be done to be able to bridge the gap between where they are now and where they need, where they need to reach. And as you can see, it's a collaboration. Teacher, the peer, and the learner. And we have these steps and these processes. The first thing is, and as I mentioned before, I need to clarify the learning outcomes. I need to make it clear to students and to myself, where do we, what do we want to expect? What do we want to attain by the end of this lesson or the end of this unit and so on? So this has to be clarified to students. In addition to the criteria for success, what would, would it mean to have mastered the unit or how to present a good lab report or a, a, a write a good essay or to do a good oral presentation? So the first thing is where we are going. This is our target. And this should be clear, that made clear by the teacher and understood by the learner and by the peers. And then of course, I need to, to engineer all the kind of formative assessments that I might want to do. I might want to have oral questioning, observation, uh, seat work, um, uh, homework, quiz, you know. Uh, I, do, I do different kind of uh, uh, discussions or tasks and I, will, I obtain the evidence that will help me identify where the learners are now. And based on that, I can see what needs to be done on my part and on the part of the students or their peers to be able to reach where we want to reach. So I provide my feedback to the learners. I decide what I need to do myself. And accordingly, we hope to achieve the learning target. 
And so here you can see the different processes uh, involved uh, in, to be able to reach the target where the learners are now and how to get there. And we activate students as you know uh, the, the owners of the learning because I have shared the criteria and they need to evaluate themselves ahead of time. And of course, their peers also are there to really uh, become an instructional resource for one another. So these are the three main steps uh, or the processes involved in while we conduct formative assessment. Here, of course, we can see the different roles the teachers can play. Uh, and, they, and I'm sure you, as teachers, you know these roles, you know. Uh, the teacher is a mentor to provide feedback and to support each student. As we mentioned, it is student-centered. The teacher is a guide to, to get diagnostic information, to lead the group uh, through the work at hand. So uh, the, the teacher also she reports, she documents the student progress and how, how, uh, how well are we attaining our learning outcomes. And the teacher is a pro makes adjustments and revisions to the instructional processes based on this evidence. So these four roles the teachers play in a formative assessment, mentor, guide, accountant, and program director. The, the teacher as a reporter is more, uh, more important in the summative kind of assessment. When I issue grades, uh, to the parents, the students, and the school administration about student progress and achievement. But also, uh, as an informative assessment, we also report in the, in the, in the, in the parent-teacher conference, which might be done uh, on a monthly basis or uh, mid-semester, mid you know, I have to really, what I have recorded about record, you know, I, I show them the progress of students in writing from the beginning of the term until now. I show them the, the how well, how well they're doing, you know. So also in the formative assessment, we also act as a reporter. But our main role as teachers basically is a mentor, a guide, and a program director. And these are really quite extensive roles and they, they teachers need to be ready and really trained to be able uh, to do these roles. And we will discuss the challenges really in, in conducting a good formative assessment later on. Now I will try to uh, give you, um, um, uh, you know, uh, briefly some practical methods to apply formative assessment. Some we use in the classroom and some a brief exposure to the digital tools. Uh, the UNESCO have prepared a wonderful report in 2021 about types of formative assessment under different modalities of teaching. And they, they've covered, you know, if it's face-to-face -face or is it a digital uh, uh, synchronous where they are all in the same time and place while, uh, or a synchronous, you know, in a different time. And what are, these are the main, the main uh, kind of formative assessment tools that they have come up with uh, in, in their report. Uh, of course, self-assessment, written assessment, projects, uh, written pieces, uh, portfolios, and they apply to all three modalities. And then, of course, with the online kind of modality, we have multimedia pieces, uh, peer assessment, Q&A forums are very, and blogs and wikis are very common. Group assignments become come into play. And with the synchronous digital media, you know, we have e-portfolios, presentations by students, debate, oral assessments become prime, uh, quizzes, adaptive tests, uh, games and competitions, really we can add. So there, there's a whole range of formative assessment tools that can be used uh, de depending on the modality of, of teaching. In our face-to-face -face classrooms, we use mostly oral questioning, quizzes, um, seat work, um, work on the blackboard, homework assignments, and and these kind of things, um, kind of tools. And uh, for example, here I'm, I'm going to list some of the uh, quick uh, examples of how we use uh, oral discussion and oral responses in the classroom. For example, after I, ex I explain something, I tell them what are the keywords 
in the lesson that really uh, express the main idea. And I give them some time to think and then really see how well, did they get the main idea from the lesson or not? Or I can ask them what are, what is, you know, I ask each one of them, what are, or some of them, what are the top two takeaways from this lesson? What do you do? What are the top two lessons that you really got or uh, the takeaway that you can, you, you have understood from this lesson, you know? And based on that, I can see if, if they have really uh, uh, understood the lesson or the main points or not. Uh, we, I can ask them to summarize a lesson and see how well they, they understood it. And then after every answer, you know, when I ask questions or ask questions in the classroom, I ask them, I ask them, what makes you say that? What makes you say that? You know, well, you know, I want them to try not to memorize, but to try and give me a reason and a rationale why they are responding in that way. And this way, it could show me if there's a misconception uh, in their understanding that they, there is a misconception and where is that misconception? Uh, uh, I can ask the students for themselves to develop questions on the lesson, you know, and then I will, I, and then I can see if they have really got the material on, or, or not. Um, I can ask them about bump in the road, what is something you did not understand or you found difficult, or what, what concept you found difficult to understand in the, in the lesson or still is unclear to you about the lesson, you know, what is something that you really understood very well, you know, these, the, these kind of questions help us a lot to identify the misconceptions, the errors, where students are in their understanding, um, we can use what we call compass points, what excites you most about the lesson so far, and what worries you, you know, we really need to get their input, and on a continuous basis, as the lesson goes on, before it becomes too late, if, I, if it becomes too late, then I might, not, I might need to revise everything and re-explain everything, so doing these during the mid-course of instruction will help a lot. Uh, I, there are also some very quick ways by which I can uh, check for understanding. For example, I ask a question and then uh, if you understood, you know, if they know how to solve the problem or they got the, the concept, put your thumbs up or put them down if you didn't or wave if you're not sure. And then I count the thumbs up and the thumbs down and see how many got the concept and how many did not. And for those who got it, we may move forward. For those who did not, we may need to do other kind of thing. So we use a lot of these and these, these kind of assessments, you know, classroom assessment make the class very lively and enjoyable and active and not really very formative. We can use a think pair share kind of technique, which is a routine allow, they allow the student to compare what they have understood from a lesson with a classmate and then for them to explain to the rest of the classroom. Or I can use voting cards, index cards, or mini whiteboards. I will ask a question and I have them write the answer on the index card or on the um, white mini board and raise them the white mini board. And then I look at the responses and then I can see if they have really understood the concept or not, and how many did and how many did not, and accordingly uh, uh, decide what I really want to do before it becomes too late. Uh, we can do a three to one thinking routine, we call it. Give me three ideas you learn. Give me two examples. Ask one question based on the lesson. You know, these are very lively ways by which we can go to understanding of students, uh, understanding of a certain lesson or and accordingly help us decide what to do next. What should I do next? Should I continue or retrace back and do some kind of revisions? We can do other, other formative assessment. We can ask them to draw uh, about the lesson, you know, what they, or part of a lesson and see any kind of misunderstanding. Uh, and a very useful uh, technique is the concept map, mind map. You know, I ask them to create a mind map or a concept map that summarizes the concepts uh, of a certain, uh, that we, we, are, we, we discussed in a certain lesson. 
And then based on how they, 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 the hierarchy or how they draw the map and how they relate the various concepts to, to each other, then I can see how well they got the, the overall picture and the linkages and the interrelationships among the various uh, facts or terms within that concept. This is a really, really very, um, uh, very useful uh, uh, formative assessment to look and identify any gaps uh, that the students may have in understanding a certain concept and the interrelationships within the concept. And accordingly, we, we can provide feedback that is tailored to the uh, to the to the gap to the to the missing information, and then ask the student to submit again. There are many, many classes classroom, formative classroom assessment. I just did, you know, um, a few of them now. And of course, uh, there are, I'll be providing you with links to look at others. Now, uh, as, as we mentioned before, uh, a digital formative assessment became very popular, especially in the, in the last uh, two, three years. And it has gained momentum and because of the need and the pandemic. And uh, it was de devised uh, to capture different forms of learning uh, by it, as it encourages self-assessment, progress tracking, and uh, teachers provide feedback to the students in a digital format. And of also, also it can serve to promote uh, teaching learning of 21st century skills, which is very important. Uh, if we um, appropriate measures are taken to ensure equity, because we know with the use of digital tools, we do have an issue of, um, of fairness and equity, and this needs to be attended to. Uh, in an online assessment learning environment, we can have both synchronous, you know, where, you know, interaction in real time at the same time, like we're doing now, you're all, we're all linked and you're all listening to my, to my presentation or asynchronous, you know, separated in time and space methods of formative assessment can be used. And in the uh, uh, UNICEF um, slide, which I shared with you, you could see what tools can be used in the synchronous and in the asynchronous um, formats. The existing communication tools available like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, phone calls, text messages, they really enable teachers and learners to interact and collaborate and facilitate digital formative assessment. And of course, le learning management tools uh, systems like Moodle, Google, Classroom, Schoolog uh, Schoology uh, have been used as centralized platforms for delivering questions, delivering tasks, quizzes, reviewing submissions, providing feedback, and these have been, uh, you know, uh, being very quite effective. Um, there are also many online applications have been developed to, uh, that can be used to record performance tasks by students, like uh, recap video response, uh, reflection for education, screen testify. These can be used that students can record their performance. Uh, they create a performance task and they record it and they can share it with the teacher and then the teacher can provide feedback. There are other specialized tools have been developed you know, in subject matter areas to facilitate personalized learning with adaptive instructions. For math, we have Dreambox Math and Wood Math. And the Dreambox Math provides math instruction based on performance and enables teachers to create integrated activities using the assigned Fox option. Or under uh, Wood Math, it's a free application automatically generates and assesses thousands of problems to meet each student's learning needs. And there are many, many others, and there are um, and in different subject areas. Uh, maybe we will have uh, in the future a session on digital formative assessment with um, an expert in this area who can probably provide um, uh, more detailed uh, ways by which these can be used. Um, the following link really provides a digital tool of uh, a full list of digital tools for formative assessment. You can get them using this link. <clears throat> Finally, you know, uh, formative assessment provides valuable information on learners' progress and on the learning process. 
However, there are several challenges that needs to be met. And we know, you could see from my description how time it's consuming it is for teachers, how, how it needs preparation of material in case she needs to do further teaching or more practice exercises or what, and, and she needs help in the classroom. So teachers will need resources, preparation, and they will need more time, which means the very heavy curriculum might not be completed in due time. And so uh, it involves really high investment of teacher time, additional costs for supplies, for space, commitment of resources to su support the professional development of teacher, time for them to plan, administer, provide feedback. You know, when you look at every assignment and try to provide specific feedback that student center, this is not easy and this is time consuming. So uh, the, the but, but these are needed for a successful uh, implementation of formative assessment. So although it really results in valuable information on learner progress and on the learning process, it still has, there are uh, sub several obstacles that need to be uh, taken care of. Um, uh, finally, formative assessment should aim to achieve its various purposes that I've just described. And at the same time, it has to really complement summative assessment. We cannot use formative assessment on something and focus on something and forget about the summative assessment at the end of the units or the semester or, or the month or whatever. They have to really work together. And results has shown that if we really do proper assessment for learning and assessment as learning, and we do the correctives and provide the right kind of feedback, a higher percentage of students are more likely go going to do better on summative assessment than otherwise. So, and especially if the formative assessment is really complementing what we need to achieve with the summative assessment. Eventually, we need to have a balanced system a system which is balanced with the right amount of assessment of learning as learning and assessment of learning, for learning and as learning and assessment of learning. So let's aim for a balanced system. And a balanced system, another, I'm going to end with another quote by Stiggins. He also worked a lot on classroom assessment. He says, a balanced system of assessment takes advantage of what an assessment of learning and assessment for learning and as learning provides. Each one of them provides us with one kind of information. And when we have a balanced system, we are, we are taking advantage of what each one of us, each one of these provides as well. Each can make essential contribution. When both are present in the system, uh, assessment becomes more just an index of success. It is just that it really serves as the cause of that success. When we have a balanced system that includes the three types and with the right balance and with the formative assessment complementing the summative assessment, then we are more likely to assure success of the, of the teaching and learning process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran, uh, Dr. Karma El Hassan, and I think you um, now deserve a break, at least to rest your voice a little bit. <laughs> um, thank you very much for this comprehensive overview. Uh, now, and so thank you, um, uh, dear participants, for your questions and um, answers and your comments and suggestions. Uh, to give a chance, Dr. Karma, to rest a little bit. Uh, at least to rest her voice because her mind has to be still very alert. I will try to summarize uh, your uh, main questions and uh, your suggestions, uh, which I uh, gathered uh, from your chat and from question and answers um, with the help of our colleagues, uh, Noor Osta and Lilian Edobazzi. So thank you very much to our colleagues. Um, 
I will um, actually uh, present these uh, questions and comments and suggestions and also comment a little bit on each. And then I will give a chance to Dr. Karma uh, to get back to, to you and to answer. Maybe some of the questions cannot be answered immediately. I saw a lot of uh, uh, requests uh, for a session that is more practical and I promise that we'll organize this session uh, next year in uh, January, late January, uh, to uh, have um, this webinar done in cooperation with uh, headquarters, as I said at the beginning, and with other partners uh, to really uh, try to see how these different um, uh, modalities uh, work in an online context, because this is what a lot of your uh, comments um, said that uh, we need some practical training on how these uh, different uh, tools and applications and uh, different uh, strategies work in an online uh, digital context. So um, one question was about, um, okay, formative assessment is very important and uh, parents should also play a role, but uh, what to do if parents are not educated? Yeah, how can they then contribute to uh, supporting uh, their children and what can teachers do? So this was one question. Uh, then uh, many questions were about uh, this issue about formative assessment, but within the distance education, uh, the online education uh, setting. And as I said, we'll come back and we'll have the next webinar will be about practice on, uh, on these topics, for instance, uh, how to use different applications like Mentimeter, uh, you can use it very nicely with Zoom uh, to actually look into students' um, capacities, into their opinions. They can give you feedback uh, because there is another question asking about the relation between teacher, students and knowledge in this um, cycle of assessment that Dr. Karma was talking about. Uh, then um, uh, this other question was exactly about this uh, connection. Uh, so this formative assessment is something that teachers can do, but also learners can be engaged with. That could be peer assessment and uh, then uh, also learners can be engaged in a kind of giving feedback to their uh, uh, teachers. Um, and this is also a little bit about the concept of uh, 360 degree <laughs> evaluation where everybody is evaluated uh, by their peers. So it's not just one direction in, uh, in assessment. Uh, then another question was about um, whether there are international or regional or local standards for assessment in uh, specialized areas, I mean in subjects probably, and um, for comparative uh, purposes. Um, and uh, Dr. Karma will probably answer, I will also add some about uh, these uh, assessment standards. Some Arab countries, they have assessment standards based on which they do national examinations, um, but others, they have also broader frameworks uh, that uh, look also into standards for formative assessment. And I would say there are no international standards as such for assessment, but there is guidance. For instance, international assessment studies such as PISA, uh, they give you an orientation with regard to what should be assessed, why, how this should be done, and for what uh, purpose, mm -hmm. how to use the results of assessment, and so on. Then uh, there was another um, very important question uh, about um, pre-learning assessment. Uh, what's the connection? Can it contribute to formative assessment? And I think this question uh, leads us also towards discussing the links between formative and summative and diagnostic assessment, because there are li links, of course. It's not that they have to be used separate, but they should reinforce and complement one another. Uh, then uh, the last question, which I have now on my list, um, it is uh, about uh, crowded classes, you know, because these formative assessments Dr. Karma was talking about, 
they may work very well if you have a small number of uh, students to take care of, but what happens when you deal with overcrowded large uh, classes and where the formative assessment can be still uh, used uh, in an effective uh, way and um, if then teachers and students can give uh, feedback mutually to one another and what tools can be used for large uh, classes. And uh, so I think um, we uh, have now uh, this uh, set of questions, they are quite a uh, few very important questions and not easy to answer to, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Karma will um, give some uh, initial thoughts and then I will complement a little bit and we'll address this uh, also in the report. And by the end of the year, we'll have, I said, uh, the um, uh, YouTube recordings on our website, uh, UNESCO Beirut office website and the report. Uh, brief reports of each of these workshops and we will get back to these uh, questions that have been listed. So thank you very much Dr. Karma for um, listening and then please you have like uh, maybe 15 minutes to get back to our uh, participants and to uh, come up with initial thoughts about these very important issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dakmara. I, I hope I got all the points. Uh, uh, anyway, I will try to answer. I will start from the last regarding the crowded classes. Um, this is an issue. Definitely, this is an issue. Um, because, um, as, as I mentioned, there are challenges with, with, the, uh, uh, with, with, with the administering formative assessment, and it, need, it needs more teacher time, more preparation, more planning, and these are not really uh, available. Uh, all the time, and we and this is even more with with the crowded classroom. So what uh, what what is recommended basically is to um, try and work within groups. You know, divide your your classroom into some kind of five six groups, and uh, you know, kind of, uh, and try to make use more use of collaborative learning, and make them mixed ability groups. You know, some good students with with the middle school students with with, the, with below average students. You know, in performance and and a heterogeneous mixed ability group, and then um, uh, then you don't have to go to every student, and then uh, you you have one. Uh, one person from that group will present, and then uh, uh, and, they, and they and then you can identify what their conception or misconception of the lesson. So using of the working in group work, small group work, cooperative work, group work, um, and having a leader and training them would, would try to help uh, this issue. But it's still uh, not it doesn't really fulfill the purpose because the more student centered and the more personalized the feedback is the more effective it is uh, in helping the student attain the uh, summative assess and the learning outcomes so this is just you know but it makes it a bit better as uh, as uh, you know uh, uh, regarding the question if there are any assessment standards not for formative assessment you know by by definition you know it depends on what you're teaching in your classroom your learning outcomes and uh, uh, and your own group you know and it has to be student centered and specific feedback to that student so uh, there are no no standards can apply for formative assessment uh, and uh, uh, you really need to, uh, your main criteria for assessing the success of your formative assessment is how well the students are attaining your learning outcome. And to the extent the, and the percentage of students attaining and and the learn your 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 learning outcomes and your, your objectives or your the standards that you have in your own country, uh, they are, as as mentioned by Dakmara, many Arab countries now have standards for different subject matter areas, and these can be followed. You know, to uh, while you're doing formative assessment to see how well you are you are uh, your students are uh, are uh, how far they are in reaching these standards. So this is the only advice I can give in this respect. Uh, definitely, we need to make use of peers a lot. 
and, and the learners and to train them. And, and this starts, you know, from early elementary, you know, when we, when we share the criteria or the rubric and we model in front of them and we do exercises in the classroom, you know, for them to practice before they start applying them to themselves, they, we, we, we will be building a, an assessor in every student and he can assess his own and he can assess his peers. And believe me, believe me, students and peers are very are quite objective in their assessment and in their evaluation. And, and maybe, maybe even more than the teacher who doesn't have time to focus on detail. And they're really quite good at that. So this is you know, a good approach to, uh, to, to invest in, you know, to spend more time in training students to evaluate themselves and evaluate their peers. Regarding the formative assessment in distance learning, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we had to use less testing, less quizzes, because we could not be, these could, these could not be reliable the results, you know, how did they do them? And, and we had to uh, uh, really focus more on um, performance assessment or classroom discussion and, you know, uh, open-ended kind, um, uh, open book kind of uh, books. You know, I, I know from my class, Classrooms. Uh, I, I, I reformulated the questions to, in, in, in a way to really emphasize higher level thinking. And it, they were open book, open notes, open presentation kind of assessments. And you know, students will sit down, but they, but they, the, I, my main focus was on how they make use of the information to try and answer a question and to really meet the outcome. So it, become, it becomes less important if they're or not, because what's more important is that they know how to make use of the information and how to put it in the answer to, to the questions. So we used more of these and less of actual objective item tests and things like, and we used a lot of oral presentations in the classroom and oral discussions. Regarding the question of parents who are not educated, it is really a big loss because now we, we cooperate with parents a lot and we involve them a lot, you know, from the beginning of the year, we meet with them, we tell them what we expected from the students, how will they be evaluated and we ask their help you know, and how we collaborate, collaborate together, especially with the pandemic when the parents have became tutors and teachers, you know, we really had to rely a lot on this and we're still doing that. So unfortunately, when they're not educate, educated, I don't know what can be done. Uh, maybe some orientation sessions for them, uh, but, uh, you know, even involving them then only to motivate the students to perform and that they have to, get, to tell them that they have high expectations from them and so on, but not actually to help them in the actual schoolwork if they, they are illiterate. So uh, did I answer all the questions, uh, Dakmara? Is there anything still missing? Uh, yes, I will uh, again give you like five minutes to rest your voice, and I will also add uh, some of my. Um, yeah, please. Uh, thinking, or, or, uh, or, or if any of the participants would like to, you know, provide their experience, uh, informative assessment, any challenges they faced, any successes, it would be interesting to uh, get the point of view. Yes, we just got another interesting question. Uh, what's the difference if there is a big difference between assessment and evaluation? So yes. I will uh, let you think about that and get back to our participants. I think it's difficult now because we have many participants. They are more than 200 and it's difficult to identify uh, um but i may ask uh, yes uh, i'm just talking for two minutes and then if uh, maybe some participant uh, would like some of the participants would like really to make a statement then please raise your hand you know and then we'll try to uh, give you the floor but uh, this is a little bit difficult if it's a large number of uh, of participants um, so, uh, with regard to this issue of uh, large groups, you know, this um, is not a new situation. Uh, since uh, the um, emergence of mass education in the um, 18th, 19th century, um, 
people had to deal with this problem, how to deal with large classes. Uh, and uh, there have been different solutions put in place. Uh, one of the best known is the so-called Lancasterian system. Uh, those who studied pedagogy probably remember from your pedagogy educational science studies about the systems when, for instance, a teacher had to deal with 200 students Wow. or more than 100 students and then uh, the students were also of different ages not just uh, one age cohort and uh, then uh, they used usually uh, learners that were more advanced um, to teach and to monitor uh, the ones that were um, in the lower grades in lower levels and my mother for instance when uh, she was a young student she was in one of these lancasterian uh, system classes um, in my home country and um, this was uh, before and during the second world war and she was often uh, telling me that uh, this uh, was uh, how it went and uh, she was uh, one of the um students that were uh, better in her classroom and uh, she then had to take care of the ones that uh, were still beginners or in um, a lower age so it was a cooperation between teachers and students that were uh, maybe uh, more advanced and this is also what uh, dr karma suggested that in the case of large group of uh, large classes uh, we can use um, peer uh, assessment, uh, we can use uh, uh, the students that are better uh, in different uh, ways and uh, somebody also uh, made a comment now about using good students, students who are uh, performant in different areas to uh, transfer their knowledge to support to monitor the others. And then Technology helps actually. Now, uh, Dr. Karma, she mentioned the ability in Zoom to have uh, breakout uh, groups and to uh, have smaller groups. If you deal with a large class, you can then uh, monitor uh, small, uh, smaller groups and use these better students, the students who can help uh, to uh, facilitate and to be co-facilitators of these activities with the teacher. That means also to engage students in uh, planning the lesson and in planning the assessment uh, task. But technology is actually helping. But we have to know what technology is offering and how to train, to be trained, for instance, to use different applications, like I mentioned before, Mentimeter. Mentimeter, you can use your phone and then you can respond immediately about questions. It could be, a, it could be uh, collecting opinions on some issues or it could be uh, just a kind of quick uh, yes or no uh, session and uh, so teachers can get immediately uh, an idea about the students learning and how they feel about uh, their tasks and how they feel about their performances and it's not just Mentimeter there are many applications that can be uh, used uh, to again uh, collect uh, feedback from learners, ask them to provide you feedback as a teacher, and this can happen again uh, within uh, smaller groups in uh, breakout uh, groups. Uh, about the parents who are not uh, educated, I mean, uh, parents, they may know a lot, but sometimes in different uh, places, we still uh, deal with parents who don't read and write. Yeah? And this is, I think, uh, what uh, our participants meant when they mentioned non-educated uh, uh, parents, because uh, sometimes they are illiterate in, uh, in terms that uh, they don't uh, read and write, and they don't use ICTs, of course. How can this happen then? Um, of course, it's not easy, uh, but I've seen uh, several um, of such experiences in different countries. Uh, and it's true that it's especially for uh, foundational skills like uh, uh, reading, writing and numeracy. Uh, parents were actually brought to school and they learned together with their children. <laughs> yeah? So this is a way to engage parents and this was especially mothers. I, I've seen these uh, videos, uh, these experiences, especially about education of uh, women and girls. And uh, this was a way to actually engage uh, parents who were illiterate uh, to 
uh, gather this to uh, to uh, be developing these skills about uh, teaching about reading uh, numeracy uh, writing with their children and then they also uh, gathered actually they develop the skills how to monitor your own uh, child and how to self-assess yourself because uh, self-assessment is also something um, related to uh, formative assessment and I think uh, uh, this is actually uh, something we have to consider for the next uh, webinar. Uh, again, the next webinar in end of January will be really uh, practical. We'll try to see how to simulate uh, all what we are preaching now, how to break up into smaller groups, how to use different applications uh, to get uh, feedback, uh, to uh, actually be able to assess and uh, to, to see uh, how uh, technology can be of help given we know how to use it and uh, we know all the multiple possibilities technology is uh, offering. So because we have only a few minutes left, uh, I would invite that, uh, Dr. Karma to uh, respond also to this um, question about the differences or the connections between assessment and evaluation. And uh, then we'll close the webinar at uh, 1.30. Thank you very much for participating and for your very interesting uh, comments and questions and for the insightful uh, suggestions for the next time. Thank you. Thank you, Dakmara. You know, assessment is a process and, and it is a process of collecting information from different sources at different times, you know, and documenting it to come up with, with, with uh, evidence regarding the uh, certain purpose, be it the attainment of objective or, or, or it is. Um, evaluation is uh, how good is that information? Do I meet, for example, if it's if I'm using standard base, am I meeting the standards? If it's I'm using criterion, you know, in evaluation, we look at the, the, the results of the assessment and we give it a value, how good it is. Against the benchmark, it could be the benchmark normative, you know, how well the group is doing. The, uh, you know, it above average, below average, or it could be against um, a criteria, a preset criteria. I want my students to be able to solve eight out of these problems and how well are they doing that or not, or against the standards. How are they meeting the standards or not? So in evaluation, we really have to decide uh, uh, how good is this information that I collected and of course, I, I, I decide that based on comparing it with a benchmark, with a reference. It could be a group, it could be a criteria, or it could be a standard. I hope that's, uh, that explains the difference between the concepts. Sorry, uh, I have to unmute me. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much so uh, for this explanation and it's clear that the two concepts are uh, connected. Um, assessment uh, is usually um, the kind of umbrella term, so to say, uh, because it embeds more uh, also qualitative aspects, not just quantitative, and uh, it's a kind of, um, let's say, umbrella uh, term and uh, it's used uh, especially more recently to focus on this uh, um, important fo function of assessment, which is not to punish learners, uh, but to help them learn, you know, and that's the, the idea of uh, assessment uh, to be formative, uh, to help learning uh, and uh, to, to be actually functioning as an opportunity to learn instead of being uh, something that uh, learners and teachers are scared about or are uh, afraid, um, fearful. And um, it's, it's actually uh, totally different. Assessment is a concept that uh, uh, is helping us progress, is helping us learn from errors because we all uh, do errors, uh, we all make errors, but we learn from them. And that's the essence of human learning. We learn from one another, we learn from mistakes, we learn from also uh, achievements, and we uh, can build in our learning progression uh, on both our weaknesses, but also our um, 
achievements and our strengths. So thank you very much. Um, everyone. Madam, I, I have one last point. Yes, you know, many comments where, you know, I, I do appreciate that there's a need for an, a more hands-on kind of a webinar. But in many of the suggestions that I used in my presentation, these are very applicable and they can be, you know, uh, participants can start to, you know, to use them, you know, uh, the, like the whiteboard or the index cards or a one minute uh, paper or, you know, summarize or the concept map, you know, these are practical and they can be used and they can provide the teacher with the, with the, uh, the kind of um, error students are facing or uh, the, the, the level of understanding of the various concepts. So uh, in time, while waiting for the more uh, hands-on and probably digital, um, the digitally focused webinar, I think it would be good to try these um, uh, tips or these quick tools to use to uh, get information regarding formative assessment. They are quite informal. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Karma. Uh, I think what our participants mentioned is that they want to practice, you know, because yeah, we were yeah. now um, having an overview of all these strategies and tools and possibilities. But uh, what would be interesting for them is really to practice, to take uh, one or two or three uh, examples of uh, possible uh, strategies. And then we do as if we are learners and uh, teachers are uh, proposing us these assessment activities and or uh, if we would train, if we would be trained as uh, teachers to use these tools, how would that function, you know, and especially to use applications and to uh, to have all these opportunities to practice what we are talking, for instance, mind maps, how we do that, you know, and uh, how uh, can we then use peer assessment? How can we break up into small groups and then come back and share and give feedback to the teachers? So this is what we'll practice uh then um, next time and uh so uh, we'll um uh, part ways now for a few weeks but we will be back january with uh, an information about this new uh, webinar uh, this upcoming oh. webinar thanking you all and wishing you a good end of the year the learning assessment framework, I see now a question is for now in English, but for January, we will also have it in Arabic. It's still a draft, it's open to discussion, and we'll have also until March next year, another webinar to discuss the learning assessment framework as, uh, as such. So Shukran, thank you very much and stay well. <laughs> Thank Everybody. you, Dr. Karma. Thank you. thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Rana. Thank you, Lilian. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, Mahmoud and Eli, our technical support. And I hope you will get the certificates because our technical support is working uh, on it. So uh, thanks. See you next time. Thank Goodbye. you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Goodbye. Uh, Karma, we can talk on uh, WhatsApp, okay, so that we also leave the, the session.